The morning frost freezes the prisoner's feet. No one would believe that hell could be so cold, but such are the early mornings in Auschwitz-Birkenau, a facility created with one sole purpose, to annihilate as many Jews as possible. The figures in striped pajamas move slowly forward, trying to loosen up their legs. In many cases they are bare The signs of gangrene are obvious, but no one comes close to picking up those who fall. Instead, figures in black surround the weakest and kick or beat them to death. The terrible machinery of death that was the Nazi death camps could not function without the well-oiled work of the guards. But not all were SS officers, there were different ranks within the brutal work at Auschwitz. The lesser-powered guards were Jews who operated for the Germans in exchange for some improvements in their very poor lifestyle, threatened with death and driven by terror, hunger and despair. Then they were followed by the Kapos, who were prisoners of German and Aryan origin, who had been transferred from maximum security prisons to reign in the cells. Finally, there were the SS men, whose job it was to carry out the systematic extermination of the Jewish people. In some cases, they also carried out the most brutal tortures, such as the infamous Wilhelm Boger, who invented a practice so sinister that it went down in history. The Boger Swing. Join us in a new episode of Military History to learn about the macabre routine of the different types of guards in the Nazi death camps. But before continuing, and if you are a fan of firearms, we want to invite you to our new channel, World of Guns, dedicated to analyzing and exploring the most powerful, modern and unusual weapons in the world, as well as their combat history, their development and much more. You can find the link to the channel in the description and in the first comment, don't miss it and give us your support by subscribing to World of Guns. And now, let's continue with today's video. In Nazi Germany, there were two types of complexes to which Jews were sent, as part of Adolf Hitler's sinister plan to exterminate them. The first was the concentration camp, huge open-air prisons, made up of barracks and workspaces, where the prisoners lived in extremely poor conditions and were forced to work until they died of starvation and exhaustion. Starting in 1941, and after the Führer decreed the final solution to the Jewish problem, the Nazis built extermination camps, or Vernich Tunsliger, which were similar to their predecessors, although they had a more sinister purpose, systematized genocide. Although the Nazis had built nearly 44,000 concentration camps, there were only seven extermination camps, since in the former people had to live for months or years, but in the latter there was only one possible destination. Among the victims who were annihilated in these death factories were more than 2.7 million Jews, almost half of those murdered during the Holocaust, and even more than the 2 million who died in the camps prior to the final solution. But in order to carry out such a brutal task, one component was necessary, having exhaustive control over the prisoners. That is why the guard systems inside the concentration and extermination camps were quite complex. As the Italian writer and Auschwitz survivor Primo Levi would later develop, the Germans sought not only to destroy the prisoners' bodies, but also their spirits. We could say that violence and brutality were the daily bread in the extermination camps, but the truth is that the prisoners received more beatings than bread in any given week. The trains arrived at the Auschwitz-Birkenau complex, the largest of the extermination centers, excessively loaded with prisoners, to the point that many Jews died of suffocation during the trip. As they got off the wagons, as if they were cattle, they were greeted by the SS guards, but they did not speak to them, they did not even insult them. The Germans simply watched the Jews terrifyingly in silence, as they considered that they did not deserve a word. For the introductions they had the Kapos. The Kapos arrived at Auschwitz in 1942, before the Jewish prisoners. These were particularly violent criminals, such as murderers or sexual abusers. But despite the fact that they were truly macabre people, they were still Aryan Germans, for which the Führer gave them a job according to their innate cruelty, to be the internal guardians of the place. 
Mainly, they were the kings of the concentration and extermination camps, but they only reigned over the Jews. Since a deportee entered the complex, he was received by one of the factions of the capos that governed the site. They brutally beat their victims, stole their shoes and the few belongings they could have taken to the field. Of course, it was normal for food rations to be taken from the weakest, those who needed them most, to hasten death by starvation and the spread of disease. The capos enjoyed a better diet and lifestyle than the Jewish prisoners, and if they were really efficient, they could occupy minor administrative positions. They could also lose their rank, making them part of the general population of the camps, and they suffered just as much as anyone else. Of course, the role they occupied varied from the beginning of Nazism to its end. In the period before the final solution, the Kapos could be political prisoners, or Jews who had served in the Jewish police in the ghettos. At this time, these higher-ranking prisoners were in charge of keeping the population calm or mediating domestic problems inside the barracks. After 1941, they were empowered to torture, brutalize, and even murder lower-ranking prisoners. However, there was an obscure position that Jews could aspire to in the death camps, but it was such a terrible job that no one wanted to do it. Starting in 1942, systematic extermination became the main activity of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Every day, thousands of prisoners were stripped naked and herded into showers, where they were gassed with Zyklon B, the pesticide the Nazis used to kill millions of innocent victims. To dispose of the bodies, large industrial ovens were created, which functioned as common crematoriums. At its busiest, 10,000 Jews were gassed and cremated daily at Auschwitz. The prisoners were led to the fake showers by German SS guards, but once the victims were dead, other people took it upon themselves to dispose of the corpse. Sonderkommandos, or special commandos, were Jews forced to work transporting the bodies of their dead comrades from gas chambers to crematoria or mass graves. Normally, these men were recruited as soon as they got off the trains that arrived at the extermination complex. Since they had to be in good health and physical capacity to carry out the sinister task, they also received differential treatment, not as good as that of the capos, but better than that of a common prisoner. They received larger food rations and could sleep in their barracks. Knowing the secrets of the Jewish Holocaust, the guards used to keep them away from the general population. Although this sounds like a good life within the possibilities of being a prisoner in Auschwitz, the truth is that many of these men committed suicide since it was the only way to avoid work. In many cases, the Sonderkommandos found the bodies of their relatives or friends among those they had to transport, in addition to the fact that the horror caused by the task led them to stop eating or to become depressed. Después de una semana, el cerebro ya no era más el mismo. Ya de ver solo tantos muertos en una vez, yo había visto en mi vida solo mi padre cuando murió. Y ver ahí miles y miles de personas aganchado uno con la otro que estaban una cosa increíble ya es, no entendías más nada de lo que está pasando At the beginning of the final solution the extermination camps had about 300 sonder commandos but in Auschwitz there were as many as 900 since the gas chambers as well as the ovens worked practically around the clock Near the end of Nazism, the SS guards began to annihilate the Sonderkommandos, as they knew the modus operandi of the Holocaust, and while most were executed, about 90 managed to hide among the general population, surviving to give their testimonies. Among the stories they had to tell, those about the camp guards stood out, specifically one, who would go down in history for his macabre and creative methods of torture. There is probably no better example of what the German guards at Auschwitz were like than Wilhelm Boger. To introduce him, it is only necessary to quote the story of a Holocaust survivor, Dunja Wasserstrom. During a selection of prisoners for his execution, Boger chose a four- or five-year-old boy who had gotten out of a truck and was holding an apple. He took the apple from him, grabbed the boy by the feet and smashed him with great force against a wall of the barracks, killing the boy immediately. He then left eating the apple. 
The truck with the rest of the children was taken to the gas chamber. Wilhelm Boger joined the Nazi party in 1929 and began his military career as an auxiliary police officer in 1933, at the same time as he entered the academy to train for the force. In 1936, he received complaints for mistreating suspects during interrogations, but that did not prevent him from being promoted to commissioner in 1937 after graduating from the academy. After spending a few years working for the state police, Boger was sent to Auschwitz. There he worked as a second lieutenant in the political department, which was part of the Reich Security Office and was known as the Concentration Camp Gestapo. His main tasks were to maintain order in the complex, organize the reception of prisoners, put down riots and conduct interrogations. Boger's character was so bloodthirsty that he soon earned the nickname the Tiger of Auschwitz. Boger carried out his tasks with the greatest cruelty, to the point that he devised a method of torture that terrified his own superiors. The Boger swing consisted of taking a long metal bar and placing it a few meters above the ground, on two wooden pillars. Then he would take a prisoner and tie him by the wrists and ankles to the bar, hands at knee height, so that he was hanging upside down, with the full weight of his body pulling on his arms. Extremities. Then, Boger hit the tortured very hard, which generated a movement that produced even more pain. Most of the victims passed out from the process and were left hanging until the sinister activities resumed. Normally, the torture went to the point of turning the victims into sacks of skin and bone, which were then taken to mass graves. Although Boger's own superiors forbade this brutal practice, the guard continued with it in secret until the evacuation of Auschwitz. Boger was arrested in 1945, although he underwent the Allies' denazification process, which allowed him to remain free until 1956. That year, along with dozens of his SS comrades, who inflicted the same type of mistreatment on prisoners, he was tried for his horrible crimes thanks to the testimonies of surviving Jews. The brutal Tiger of Auschwitz was convicted of 144 murders by his own hand, 10 murders with other perpetrators, and complicity in the murder of more than 1,000 people as part of his duties as a member of the Auschwitz staff. In 1965 he was sentenced to life imprisonment and sent to the Biotime Bissingen prison, where he died on April 3, 1977, while in captivity. Thank you very much for joining us until the end. Stay tuned for our next video.